Intent appears to go after the Libyan military so hard that in order to survive, it will force Muammar Gaddafi out. But at the same time, it appears m very clear uh, that for the White House and its allies, they want m uh, Gaddafi gone in a regime change. Lester. Jim McLeshevsky at the Pentagon. Thanks. Now to Libya. Jim Iseda is in Tripoli, which is part of a new no-fly zone in effect. Now he has the view from the ground tonight. Only days ago, pro-Qaddafi forces were pushing relentlessly along this road and about to take the rebel capital of Benghazi. But today, this is what remains. Bodies among dozens of destroyed tanks and artillery pieces, some still smoldering. Now, some 20 miles from Benghazi, there were only rebels, all confident that with their newly found firepower, they could beat Gaddafi. We are against him completely, no one. It's over, for one is over, over, over. But Gaddafi has other ideas. In a new voice recording, which aired on Libyan TV today, he called the airstrikes acts of terror and swore he'd defeat the invaders. We are preparing ourselves for a long war in a vast land that you cannot fight on, he said. And his forces were on the attack again in rebel-held Misrata, with tank and sniper fire reportedly killing two. Meanwhile, images of the dead and wounded, identified as casualties from the airstrikes, appeared throughout the day on Libyan TV. Officials put the death toll at 64, just in the western half of the country. U.S. military officials deny any knowledge of civilian casualties, but the issue, along with today's U.S. strike on Gaddafi troops, has already raised questions about the purpose of the day-old no-fly zone. Even Amr Musa, the Secretary General of the Arab League, whose backing was critical in launching the military operation, expressed grave concern today about mounting casualties. What has happened is different to the objectives we set, he said. We need to be protecting civilians, not bombing more civilians. But with a mandate to use all necessary means to stop Gaddafi's attacks, NATO warplanes were in the skies again tonight over Tripoli. Triggering a hail of tracers and anti-aircraft fire, the city on a knife's edge. Lester, at one point tonight we heard an explosion that seemed to come from the general direction of Gaddafi's compound. Immediately the rumors spread that he might have been hit. Minutes later we learned that the U.S. government had issued, issued a short statement, Colonel Gaddafi is not a target. Lester? Jim Seda in Tripoli, thanks. Just who are these anti-Gaddafi fighters the U.S. is in effect helping to support? Our chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel, has crossed from Egypt into rebel-held territory in Libya. He has that part of the story from Tobruk tonight. As we crossed from Egypt to eastern Libya today, it didn't look like the latest American military intervention in the Middle East had just begun. The mood was calm. We easily passed through relaxed rebel checkpoints. A week ago, as Gaddafi's forces were advancing, we watched people on this same road take down rebel flags, preparing to switch sides. Now the flags are back up. But at a checkpoint on the outskirts of Tobruk, it's obvious the rebels still need a great deal more help. Many of the rebels were unarmed. Those that were fired in the air, apparently without reason. There was a tank by the side of the road, but no one in it. I asked one of the rebels what he thought about the foreign military strikes. They're wonderful, he said. All of Libya is happy. God willing, there will be more of them, so we can go to Gaddafi's palace in Tripoli. There were more signs of that renewed confidence in central Tobruk, a sleepy Mediterranean port city. Thank you for Obama, because he, is, he is helps to people in Libya. Traffic thronged the streets. The main market was full of boys selling eggs, women selling milk, a man fixing shoes. The people here believe they're now safe. There is a feeling of relief here that finally help has come. Until the U.S. and European air and missile strikes, the rebels were about to lose this war. Now there's a hope they can turn it around. Today was a major victory for the rebels, but this war won't be won with a few well-placed airstrikes.
Rebels tell us, Lester, they also need money, medicine, and weapons if they're going to defeat Gaddafi in any reasonable amount of time. Richard, have the rebels coalesced under, uh, under a specific command or individual? No, uh, they, these would be what you'd call old-fashioned freedom fighters. They only have one goal, and that is to topple Muammar Gaddafi. They're a very mixed group, uh, a ragtag army, if you will. Some of them are unemployed people, they are students, Islamists, and they believe the U.S. is firmly behind them to topple Gaddafi, and they believe that this is a long-term relationship. Richard Engel in Libya tonight. Thanks. President Obama remains in Brazil where he stayed quiet today on his decision to use force against Gaddafi. Chief White House correspondent Chuck Todd is traveling with the president in Rio. Hi, Chuck. Good evening, Lester. Well, the president got, has gotten two briefings today on the military progress in Libya, one this morning and then one this afternoon. I just came out of a briefing with some uh, senior national security officials uh, and they provided a little bit more information. The president called the King of Jordan. Part of that phone call was the hope of getting Jordan to get involved in the enforcement of the no-fly zone in the next few days, which the administration believes they will be able to hand off this military campaign, which is a U.S.-run military campaign. They still believe they can hand that off to an international coalition to mo enforce the no-fly zone in the next days, not weeks. Part of that phone call to the King of Jordan, trying to recruit Jordan to be a part of this. They want more Arab nations involved. As for the Arab League criticism of this no-fly zone and the idea that maybe it went beyond the United Nations, the administration says that's not true, that that resolution, what they're doing, it, they are following the letter of that resolution and the Any Means Necessary Clause, and they also believe the Arab League will pull back some of that criticism. But it's been a diplomatic tap dance today behind the scenes, Lester. You've seen a lot of members of Congress go out today, and the president's been criticized both left and right, some because uh, arguing that he's taken too long. Speaker Boehner is upset that he hasn't done enough consultation with Congress. And of course, some of the liberal members of the president's own party are upset that he started yet another military campaign. And to top it all off, here is the front page of the O Globo, the largest paper here in Rio. They're trying to do outreach to Brazil. Well, the headline is that the president comes to Brazil and translated it says, Obama orders attack on Libya, then shows a picture of the president of Brazil and the president of the United States toasting. So even here in Latin America, he can't escape the story on Libya, Lester. Chuck Todd with the president tonight. Thank you. Here to share some military insight into all this now is retired U.S. Army General Barry McCaffrey, an NBC News analyst. Let me ask you first, General, are we at war? This is obviously more than a no-fly zone patrol. Is this war? Well, it couldn't be. Otherwise, the War Powers Act of 1973 would have been invoked. Uh, Lester, what happened today was extremely good performance by the U.S. Armed Forces. Clearly, we now dominate Libyan airspace. That's a good thing. A good thing so that UK and French and US fighter bombers can go take down uh, his center of gravity, which is tanks, artillery, uh, armored personnel carriers. And they've started that, which is even better news. Finally, Admiral Mike Bell Mullen this morning uh, essentially said, we're also going to take down his logistics system. So for the time being, I think we've stopped Gaddafi in his tracks. Are there limits to the use of air power under these circumstances? Are you concerned that the use of ground troops has been taken off the table? Well, I think um, <clears throat> it's un probably unfortunate we said that up front, but that, the domestic politics required that. Um, it's also clear to me that uh, the air cap itself, I mean, the UAE will come in and gutter and possibly Jordan uh, with fighter interceptors, but you've got to go after his ability to dominate these urban areas. That's the tanks, the armored personnel carriers, and the artillery. And that has started, and that can't be backed off. And it's not just Benghazi in the east. It's also the other cities uh, outside of Tripoli. General McCaffrey, thanks for sharing your thoughts with us tonight. As we continue on nightly news on a Sunday, just when it seems hard to believe there's anybody still alive in the rubble of northern Japan, a stunning rescue to tell you about. And later, how the nuclear nightmare in Japan is sparking new worries about a long controversial nuclear plant here in the U.S. Well, an 80... Log on to learn more.
We're back now with the latest on the disaster in Japan. Nine days after the earthquake and tsunami, the death toll is nearly 8,500, and there are still nearly 13,000 people listed as missing. Both numbers are expected to go even higher. And today we learned of an incredible story of survival. An 80-year-old woman and her grandson were found alive in the wreckage of her home. They'd been living on yogurt and water in the kitchen on the second floor. Their rescue is giving new hope to those still searching for their loved ones. Tonight, our Ian Williams reports from Miyako, Japan, one of the many devastated towns where the search is still going on. Today we reached Miyako, or at least what's left of this once bustling fishing town. Hundreds died here. Soldiers were continuing to scour the rubble, <coughs> turning over the battered shell of a car in search of bodies. This officer told me they'd still not given up hope of finding people alive. Neither had this man, with two friends still missing. This had been their house. But it's been nine days since the quake and tsunami devastated this town. The search and rescue phase is winding down, replaced by a clean-up and relief operation. The police bringing a strange orderliness to the rubble-lined streets. Survivors wandering down paths cleared through the debris still seem stunned by what had happened to their neighborhood. The cleanup here in Miyako is progressing, but there's no power and there's no water in what remains of the town. Survivors complain that very few basic supplies are getting through to them. We don't have enough water, food or fuel, this man told me, huddled with other survivors around a makeshift heater beside their small shelter. While they cooked, a radio announcer gave a roll call of the missing with descriptions of what they looked like and pleas from relatives, hoping their loved ones might still be traced, perhaps huddled in another shelter, in another battered part of the town that was once Miyako. Ian Williams, NBC News, Miyako. Meantime, the desperate effort to stop the radiation disaster at that nuclear plant north of Tokyo is showing some signs of progress tonight, but the nuclear threat is far from over, and the newest evidence is in the food supply. NBC's Robert Bazell now with that part of the story. As they struggle to contain the radiation, engineers now have some kind of water supply going in all of the reactors. For now, water temperature and pressure is either holding steady or falling in each of them. We've been making some sure and steady progress. But radiation at the site remains high, spreading contamination that has been showing up in milk and some vegetables, first spinach, now other leafy vegetables. The government has banned all milk shipments from the area near the reactors, but vegetables with low levels of radiation have been found far from the site. And even if the health risks are considered low, there is growing concern. At a Tokyo market, we spoke with Kyoko Kanu, who told us she's worried about the effects of radiation on her children. But Ikuku Fujiami has a different attitude, saying it's her duty to help the farmers. We have to support each other. Indeed, farmers very much fear their produce will be rejected, not just in Japan, but throughout the world. Cheoka Kaizuka is a spinach farmer in Inboraki Prefecture, north of Tokyo. It's the planting season from now on. I don't know what's going to happen with this radiation, but we can't carry on as farmers. Her concerns may be justified. We bought our own spinach in the Tokyo market and tested it with our own radiation device. Most batches had nothing above the normal background rate of about one count per second. But one had a rate of two counts per second. That's well within safety standards, but it's an indication that radiation has spread in the food supply into the market. And yet the real damage may be in perceptions, false rumors about all kinds of Japanese food being unsafe or spreading around the world. We wish to bring the nuclear power plant under control as quickly as possible so we can put a stop to the damages caused by these rumors. It could take weeks or even months to get the reactors under control to stop the radiation, the contamination, and the rumors. Lester? Robert Bazell in Japan. Up next, the radiation risk at home. The new debate over a nuclear reactor amid one of the most densely populated regions in the world. Have you been diagnosed with an irregular heartbeat called atrial fibrillation?